Needless to say, things didn't exactly improve at Hogwarts as challenges continued to persist, creating a lingering sense of unease among students and teachers alike. The trolls' attack on Halloween night had only served to increase the tension, and Harry was sure that the subsequent events would be even more unpredictable and dangerous, making him extra cautious as he ventured out into the dark halls of the castle. When the school reopened after the troll attack and classes resumed, Harry found himself confronting Patrick, Ron, and Hermione in the Great Hall. Apparently, Patrick had been missing when the troll attack happened, and Harry couldn't help but wonder if somehow, Patrick ended up getting hurt or killed in the attack. But seeing him still alive and with Ron and Hermione made him feel better, yet there was something particular about Ron and Hermione that he didn't like. Harry said to Patrick, what happened to you? First, you disappeared during the troll attack and no one could tell me anything. About that, Patrick said as he told the story about how he had run into the corridor during the evacuation from the Great Hall and reached the girls' bathroom, only to see Hermione being attacked by a troll. Luckily for her, Ron had gone with Patrick, and the two boys managed to stop the troll and save Hermione. I'm not sure if I want to believe all of that, but I'm glad you're okay, said Harry, looking relieved. After all, Dudley and Jonathan couldn't tell me anything and who knows what else might have happened, you didn't get in any trouble for that, or did you? Not exactly, said Patrick nonchalantly, shrugging his shoulders. But Hermione did lose a few points for not being at the evacuation point where the Gryffindors were supposed to meet. Plus, Ron and I had gotten a few points each for saving Hermione, but I don't see the point of having all these house points. Harry chuckled, agreeing with Patrick's sentiment about the house point system at Hogwarts. It often seemed like a trivial aspect of their magical education compared to the more pressing issues they faced. Harry then said, if I ran the school, the house points would be the first thing to go. The house point system is stupid and it just adds unnecessary competition and stress to everyone's lives, you know. Agreed, Eleanor said as she, Philip, Duncan, and Candice approached them. The house point system doesn't have anything to do with going to school. It doesn't do anything but promote division and rivalry between the houses. We should focus on working together and supporting each other instead of competing all the time, she continued in a casual tone. Hermione glared at Eleanor as she said, How could you say something like that? The house point system is a great idea, you're just bitter about not being in the best house at Hogwarts. But that's to be expected of a Ravenclaw, or am I wrong? Come on, can't we all just appreciate the friendly competition and camaraderie it brings? Let's not let house rivalry get in the way of our friendship. What are you talking about? Harry snapped as he faced Hermione. We are not friends, and we don't do friendly competitions. You think that's how we roll around here? I hate to break it to you, but you're living in a world where things are a bit more serious, Hermione replied casually, raising an eyebrow. But hey, if you want to stay in your own little bubble, be my guest. Now, for the last time, leave me alone, Harry snapped, his tone firm. I don't like you and I don't want to be your friend. I'm already not in the same house as you, so get off my back. Harry then stormed away, with his friends following him. Patrick said to Hermione, you clearly don't have good social skills, do you? Harry Potter isn't the type of bloke that you can put down and think that it's okay. Why didn't he go into Gryfinder? Ron snapped. I mean, he should have gone into Gryfinder when he was supposed to. Patrick turned to Ron and said, I'm going to tell you something important, so you better shut up and pay attention. Harry Potter is the boy who lived, not the boy who should have gone into Gryfinder. That means he has made his own choice to go to Ravenclaw, and we aren't to question his choices. And it's not our place to judge where he belongs. Ron said, but why would Harry choose Ravenclaw over Gryfinder? Isn't he supposed to a true Gryfinder at heart? To be honest, Harry has always been more than what people expect him to be, 
said Patrick. He has never followed the path that was laid out for him. And maybe that's what makes him truly exceptional. Ron nodded in agreement, a newfound understanding dawning on him. You're right, Patrick. Harry's always defied expectations and forged his own destiny. Whether it's Gryfinder or Ravenclaw, he'll undoubtedly make a mark wherever he goes. Hermione was not happy, as she said, how can Harry be so happy in Ravenclaw when he's clearly supposed to be in Gryfinder? Patrick gently touched Hermione's arm, offering reassurance. I understand your concern, Hermione, but Harry has made his decision, and that decision reflects his growth and complexity. He values knowledge and wisdom just as much as bravery. So, we're going to have to trust his judgment. At the same time, Professor Snape saw the trio and said, I see that you three are having a discussion about Mr. Potter's recent house placement. Hermione tensed at Snape's interruption, but Patrick stepped forward confidently. Yes, Professor Snape, we were just discussing Harry's choice to join Ravenclaw. Snape's expression was inscrutable as he regarded the trio. Mr. Potter's decision is indeed unusual, but it is not for us to question his motivations. Hermione bit her lip, still unconvinced. But Professor, Gryfinder is where Harry belongs. He's always exemplified the qualities of bravery and courage. Snape's gaze softened slightly as he regarded Hermione. Miss Granger, while Gryfinder may be where Mr. Potter has thrived, we must remember that individuals are not defined solely by their house. Harry's journey is his own, and he may find new strengths and opportunities in Ravenclaw. Ron nodded in agreement, sensing the weight of Snape's words. You're right, Professor. Harry's always been one to defy expectations. Maybe this is just another step in his journey. Snape inclined his head slightly. Indeed, Mr. Weasley. Time will reveal the wisdom of Mr. Potter's decision. For now, let us trust in his judgment and continue to support him as he navigates this new chapter. Shortly after Harry's encounter with Ron and Hermione, he said to Philip, Eleanor, Duncan, and Candice, will I never stop dealing with Ron and Hermione? I chose Ravenclaw, and they just can't seem to accept it. Philip chuckled, shaking his head. You know how they are, Harry. Gryfinder through and through. Eleanor raised an eyebrow, a thoughtful expression on her face. But Harry, why Ravenclaw? What made you decide to go to Ravenclaw instead of Gryfinder? Harry paused, reflecting on his choice. For a long time, he had been considered a child prodigy due to his interest in science, yet he was questioning the validity of magic and why it seemed to defy the laws of physics. The allure of the unknown tugged at his curiosity. With a determined gleam in his eye, he resolved to explore both worlds, determined to uncover the truths hidden within each, embarking on a journey that would challenge his beliefs and redefine his understanding of reality. I've always admired Ravenclaw's dedication to learning and creativity, said Harry. Plus, the sorting hat did suggest it when I was being sorted. Duncan grinned, clapping Harry on the back. Well, mate, you're definitely in good company here. We Ravenclaws stick together. Candice nodded enthusiastically. Absolutely. You totally belong here with us. And don't worry about Ron and Hermione. They'll come around eventually. Harry smiled, grateful for his friend's support. Thanks, guys. I just hope they understand that this doesn't change who I am. Philip put a reassuring hand on Harry's shoulder. They'll understand, Harry. And if they don't, well, we'll just have to remind them what being a true friend really means. With a renewed sense of confidence, Harry walked alongside his Ravenclaw companions, ready to embrace the new adventures that awaited him. It was now Christmas time. Harry sighed as he watched his dorm mates pack their bags. Almost everyone was heading home for the holidays. Most students opted to go home for the holidays due to the troll attack, 
but there were some who chose to stay at Hogwarts. Harry had wanted to return to the Evanses for Christmas, but Dumbledore refused to let him go. Patrick and Agnes were also forced to stay at Hogwarts. Dudley had gone home the first chance he had gotten. Harry said to Philip, I don't know why, but this doesn't feel right. I avoided Dumbledore's plot to force me to go into Gryfinder, but is still trying to manipulate my life. I want to make my own choices, even if they lead me away from the path others expect me to follow. Philip nodded, understanding Harry's frustration. It's your life, Harry. Follow your instincts, even if it means forging a new path. Trust yourself, and you'll find your way. Encouraged by Philip's words, Harry felt a renewed sense of determination. He knew the road ahead would be fraught with challenges and uncertainties, but he also knew that staying true to himself was the only way to live a life free from the constraints of others' expectations. With newfound resolve, Harry set out to carve his own destiny, guided by the compass of his heart and the strength of his convictions. Nicholas saw Harry and said to him, Why are you so upset? Harry said, Because once again, I have to deal with Dumbledore and his constant meddling in my life. I thought by now that I would be free from his control by going to Ravenclaw instead of Gryfinder, but he won't let me live my life. It's no surprise that he had to force Patrick Harvey to play the part of the boy who lived and not let him have his own life. Why does that not surprise me, said Nicholas. I should have known that Dumbledore would continue to pull the strings, no matter who the hero is. Was there no one else who could have played the role, said Harry. Besides Patrick, who doesn't have any magic in him. Nicholas said, well, there is Neville Longbottom, but Dumbledore doesn't see him as the chosen one, destined for greatness. No, Patrick is a convenient pawn. Moldable, unsuspecting. Dumbledore's always had a pangshang for playing the long game, even if it means sacrificing a pawn, or two. Nicholas narrowed his eyes, a flicker of worry in their depths. Though an unmagical pawn against you know who. It feels awfully reckless, even for Dumbledore. How could he do this to an innocent child, especially a child who has no magic? Harry snapped. Patrick doesn't deserve this. He's ten years old. Naive, sure, but with a good heart. Dumbledore might be playing chess, but Patrick's being thrown onto the battlefield blindfolded. It's not a game anymore, Nicholas. This is a child's life on the line. Harry's voice trembled with a mix of anger and fear. The weight of Dumbledore's plan, and Patrick's unwitting role, settled heavily on him. But then another issue came up, the issue of Agnes Parker. Like Patrick, she was a ten-year-old Hogwarts student who was sorted into Gryfinder, yet she was more than capable of being more heroic than Patrick. After all, Agnes had faced many dangers and protected Patrick from the Dursleys long before she recruited Harry to switch places with Patrick and help him escape from the Dursleys. Harry then said to Nicholas, I was just thinking about why Agnes had to be dragged into this situation. It's already bad enough that Dumbledore had to force Patrick to a role that he wasn't meant to play, but why did Dumbledore have to choose Agnes to play a role in the story about the boy who lived when she's also ten years old like Patrick? What is Dumbledore planning with this charade? Does Agnes even know the truth? Is Dumbledore using her innocence to manipulate the narrative? This whole thing feels wrong, Nicholas. We can't, just let innocent children be pawns in this war. Harry's voice grew steely. A sense of urgency bloomed in his chest. He knew he had to act, and fast, to protect the unsuspecting Patrick and Agnes from whatever Dumbledore had planned. Harry and Nicholas had no idea that Patrick, Agnes, and Agnes's friend Harley Parkinton, Agnes's other friends Abigail Beaufort and Julian Olson were going home for the holidays, were overhearing the conversation. Patrick said to Agnes, Did you hear that? Dumbledore's using us. Like, using us, using me. His voice wobbled, 
fear replacing his usual bravado. Agnes, eyes wide, whispered, but Dumbledore's good, isn't he? Like Harry. Harley chimed in, ever the pragmatist, good or not, sounds like we're in the middle of something dangerous. Maybe we should tell someone, someone who can actually help. Patrick swallowed. The weight of the situation settled on his young shoulders. He looked at Harry and Nicholas, their voices muffled through the thin wall. A decision had to be made, and soon. That Christmas, Harry found himself sitting alone in the Ravenclaw common room. The usual buzz of activity was replaced by a strange quiet. Most students had left for the holidays, leaving the once bustling common room echoing with a loneliness that mirrored the hollowness in his chest. He traced the familiar worn armrests of an armchair, his gaze lingering on the dying embers in the fireplace. The weight of recent events pressed down on him Dumbledore's secret plan, Patrick and Agnes' unwitting involvement, and the gnawing fear that he, once again, wasn't being told everything. At the same time, Patrick, Agnes, and Harley were in the Great Hall, watching as the remaining students and staff threw a party. A pitiful display of festive cheer hung in the air, tinsel drooping from the deserted walls. Patrick kicked at the floor, the polished stone feeling cold beneath his trainers. Envy pricked him as he watched the small group of Gryffindors by the fireplace, their laughter echoing unnaturally in the vast space. Agnes clutched a forgotten mince pie, her lower lip trembling. Harley, ever practical, nudged Patrick with his elbow. Maybe we should have gone home after all, he muttered, his voice barely a whisper. But Patrick knew they couldn't. Not with the weight of Dumbledore's secret, and the chilling possibility of their own destinies hanging over them. Nicholas approached them and said, What are you children up to? Patrick said, Is it true what you said to Harry? Am I to be a pawn in Dumbledore's scheme? Why is he using me? Harry Potter is no one's pawn, said Nicholas. And besides, Dumbledore rarely reveals his full hand. There's always more at play than what we see. He knelt before Patrick, his gaze serious. There might be a reason you, an unmagical boy, are crucial. Perhaps your ordinariness is exactly what's needed. A weapon no one expects. Agnes, Clutching the forgotten mince pie tighter, piped up, but what about me? I don't understand. Why did Dumbledore choose me to play a friend in this story? Nicholas sighed. There's a lot I can't tell you, but trust me, you being close to Patrick is important. You might be the bridge between his normalcy and whatever extraordinary role he's destined for. Harley, ever the pragmatist, chimed in, so... Are we just supposed to sit here and wait for whatever Dumbledore throws at us? Nicholas, a small smile playing on his lips, looked at Harley. Not at all, young man. Observation is a powerful tool. Keep your eyes and ears open, and most importantly, keep each other safe. You three, unlikely as it may seem, are now a team. Harley frowned as he said, why would Dumbledore have the school bring in a group of ten-year-olds here, when most of the first-year students are eleven years old? It's not like they snuck in, they had trunks and owls. There's something fishy going on, and us three being stuck in the middle of it feels less and less like a coincidence. Who knows, said Nicholas. Anyway, I implore you to keep your eyes and ears open, and say nothing about what you have overheard to anyone. Trust only me and Harry. We will figure this out, one way or another. Patrick frowned, realizing that staying safe with this newfound knowledge was easier said than done. He knew that Dumbledore had the power to manipulate people like chess pieces, and Patrick wasn't about to be a pawn in the old man's game. A spark of defiance ignited within him. He wouldn't be a passive participant, he'd find a way to take control of his own destiny. The next day, however, Patrick found himself in the library staring out the window, Agnes, Harley, and the remaining students were outside having a snowball fight. Harry walked up to Patrick, saying, You're concerned about Dumbledore, aren't you? 
I don't know why Dumbledore can't take care of his own problems without involving a group of innocent children, said Patrick. What is he trying to prove? It's not about proving anything, Patrick, Harry said softly, pulling up a chair opposite him. Dumbledore believes there's a reason you're here, a reason you might be the key. But even he can't see the future perfectly. Patrick scoffed. A key. I'm just a regular kid who can't even tie his shoelaces without tripping. Regularity can be powerful, Patrick, Harry said, a glint in his eyes. Think about it, you're an outsider, someone no one expects. You wouldn't be on anyone's radar. Maybe that's exactly what's needed. Patrick pondered this, a flicker of hope igniting within him. But Agnes, why would he involve her? Perhaps you need a tether to normalcy, Harry continued, someone who keeps you grounded while you navigate this extraordinary world you've been thrust into. The library door creaked open and a flustered Agnes peeked in, her hair dusted with snow. Patrick, have you seen Harley? He threw a snowball at Professor Flitwick, and now he's chasing him around the courtyard. Patrick and Harry exchanged a wry smile. Maybe normalcy wasn't quite the word for Agnes, but her loyalty and friendship were undeniable. Thanks, Harry, Patrick said, feeling a newfound resolve. I think I know what I need to do. He found Harley hiding behind a large stone statue, Professor Flitwick's tiny figure sputtering in frustration nearby. With a mischievous grin, Patrick launched a perfectly aimed snowball, soaking the professor's hat. Professor Flitwick whipped around, his face turning the color of a beetroot. But before he could unleash a scolding, Patrick interjected, Professor, I apologize for the disruption. Perhaps a truce could be declared. We could all use some warming hot chocolate. Professor Flitwick, momentarily stunned, looked between the three children. Then, a hint of a smile played on his lips. Hot chocolate sounds delightful, Mr. Patrick Harvey, he said, extending a hand. And these are my friends, Agnes Parker and Harley Parkinton. Professor Flitwick shook their hands, a twinkle in his eye. Well then, Patrick, he said, adjusting his soggy hat. Lead the way. As they walked towards the warmth of the kitchens, Patrick realized something. Maybe Dumbledore's plan wasn't about using them as pawns, but about preparing them. They were a team, a unique blend of ordinariness and hidden potential. And together, they were ready to face whatever challenges awaited them.